Okay. Okay. Um, they asked me to show you some stuff I brought down. Um, I brought stuff. They asked me to show it here rather than put it out. Um, this is uh, a piece of briar. That's what uh, you make the pipes out of. It's a wood that comes from uh, 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 the mountains around the Mediterranean Sea. You can get it from Greece, Spain, Italy. Um, and this is just an extra piece, and I made a box out of it. It's 16 threads the inch, which is kind of, I mean, I've tr chased a lot of other threads, but it's the primary uh, thread that I chase. Um, this is an acorn, and it's, uh, this part of it is a uh, magic medicine nut. It's uh, palm tree seed, and it looks like those are 16s also, and this is, uh, tulip wood. And I do this regularly. I make uh, the nut part out of a nut and then use wood to make the top. Um, I make a lot of spheres, but I also make a lot of eggs. And this is uh, pink ivory. And it's just uh, it's a little bit brittle, but it's not too bad to chase threads in. Uh, it used to be that any time I found a new wood, I'd make a, a spherical box out of it. Sure. Uh, this is uh, African blackwood, and it's the first time I ever got a piece of African blackwood that was actually a log. And so you can see the, uh, the heartwood and then the sapwood all around it. This came out of a, uh, a clarinet bell blank. And it's, it was kind of a fun thing. It's a uh, box inside of a box. And inside of a box. And I think, I think they're all 16s. Blackwood's pretty interesting. It's a little bit sticky feeling, but it's uh, plenty hard. Uh, I don't think there's anything here you can hurt, so just do whatever you want with it. Um, this is... Uh, This is the uh, basic form of the pipe I'm going to make today. And I'm only going to do the turning, right? So um, essentially everything not covered by my fingers, inside and out, I will turn. So it'll have a big square place right here that has to be done by hand. The stems are uh, uh, made out of two pieces. And so it's got a, a hollow form in it, 16 threads the inch. And the stems have to be made out of two pieces. Uh, the reason that's true is wood, when you get it wet, uh, wet or heated, it expands and contracts. And this still seals. It has to be an airtight seal. This still seals, but it'll screw in a little further or not quite as far. And the consequence of that is that your stem also ends up going too far or not far enough. So you make them separate, and then you can place them however you want. Um, this, this is not the biggest one I've ever made, but it's one of the larger ones that I make recently. Most of the, the walls on these are uh, uh, 3 30 seconds. Some of them might go as much as an eighth. Um, and so this is kind of, uh, it's not the first time a dual chamber pipe has been made, but I don't think anyone else has made any like this. Um, there's an old kind of pipe called a Captain Warren, and essentially Captain Warren was a bowl, a briar bowl that under, unscrews, and then you have a, uh, uh, an air chamber inside. And the uh, traditional ones are very straight. Sometimes they are flat bottoms, but maybe they're rounded, but it's very, it's very straight from here to here. Um, and they're also quite a bit smaller. And so what I did is I wanted to expand the air chamber, because that's where the good happens. And I also, uh, this is the bowl, most bowls of pipes like this have a hole right in the middle. And consequence is little bits of tobacco fall in that uh, hole and plug it. And then you have to get it back out. So this one is not such a problem, but some of them I make are uh, almost spherical. And so this bowl is uh, flush. And the only way to uh, 
take it out and stick your thumb in it. And if you've got lit tobacco, that's a problem. <laughs> so what I did was I, uh, I put two draft holes in the bowl and they face towards the front and so, and they go out at the side. So you don't plug them up. And so this also, again, even though there was a pipe called the Captain Warren, this is not like any other. Uh, like I said, uh, this comes from uh, the mountains around the o uh, Mediterranean Sea. In fact, you only get it from one side of the mountains, the side that doesn't get much rain. Um, it's the uh, root burl of the white heath tree. And in America, we call it briar. They actually call it briar in, in Europe as well. Uh, it's been uh, cut into this general shape, and then it's been boiled for uh, five, six hours. Sometimes they'll even do it more than once and then dried. As you can tell, the big red one, in fact, both of those, if you look at them, uh, they're turned on uh, four axes. But it turns out that uh, what I thought was cool, others don't. And so uh, I'm only going to turn this on uh, three axes. Sorry, they sell better. Okay. So what I'm doing is dressing up the end, the back end of this, where the, uh, the little plug screws in. The uh, first thing I'm going to do is drill a draft hole. And you have to drill it before you start hollowing, because after you hollow it, you end up with uh, too great of a distance across the chamber, and your drill bit will flex. So you have to drill it now. There we go. Going to give the uh, drill bit a little place to start. My nifty super, super sharp skew it won't be sharp anymore. Generally when I drill, I slow down quite a bit, about 500, 600. Get up real close. Now, I'm not going to drill very far. Can you see that the uh, drill bit is flexing? No lathe that I've ever used is uh, the tailstock is true. And so the second problem is because the drill bit is thin, uh, it will also wander. And so the technique I use to cause that not to happen is to drill it by hand. And what I'll do is as I drill this, I will spin the uh, chuck. And what happens is uh, all of the variations get equalized. And uh, the drill bit goes straight. And it really works. I mean, you can go five or six inches easily and they'll go straight. Uh, I also do this like, uh, you know, the stems. I make the stems. Mostly I make them out of uh, hardened rubber, but I sometimes make them out of pen blanks. And when I, uh, you have to drill a draft hole through it too, and I use the same method. So they're five inches long. So it's going to be the draft hole. It goes into the tobacco chamber. Yes but I'm going to make this stem in go away. Okay. Yes. Okay. So most of the way there. Dig out my long drill bit. Uh, does anybody know about the laws of wood turning? Uh, the second law is you can uh, 
take it off, you can't put it back. And uh, I mean, it's true of life in a number of respects. And so one of the first things I did here was check to see uh, how much room I had on the piece of wood. If you drill too far, even if you don't go all the way out, no one will buy the pipe. People, uh, the pipe making world, at least in America, is a very particular bunch of people. They want uh, this draft hole in the very, very bottom of the tobacco chamber. No place else will uh, is acceptable. It cannot deviate side to side. That's why getting this hole straight is so important. Uh, the hardness of this wood is uh, it's probably about white oak, uh, but it tends to be not quite as brittle as oak. It's very good for chasing threads. It's a little bit expensive. Uh, block, uh, probably the cheapest block you can get is about 25 bucks, and uh, that big red one that I sent around costs 70. And so it's inadvisable to. Uh, break the laws, or try to anyway. We'll go over the laws, you know, as we work here, as they come up. There's a fifth law I've been thinking about, but I haven't really figured out the best way to say it. You know, I, I, I want to uh, make a statement that we're talking about laws, right? We're not talking about rules or, you know, like the law of gravity and things like that. Well, the fifth law that I'm thinking about is cutting what don't need cutting will not get cut what needs cutting. One more time. Cutting what don't need cutting will not get cut what needs cutting. <laughs> One of the things I see uh, frequently in some students is uh, if you've got a bowl with a hump in it and they're, they're trying to get that hump out, they'll start here and they'll work a little ways and say, no, that ain't right. And then they go back to the start and they'll do it again. And all the time they're doing that, they're making that hump bigger. So it only helps to cut what needs cutting. Okay, I think that's good. I want the uh, chamber to be large if I can do it. Let's see. No, nope, ain't going to work. Make sure it's tight. You know, one of the laws, no, it's actually a law, but tendencies is you move something out of the chuck and you'll never get it back. Okay, so I'm going to take a test here, see if this works. I think I'm going to do it. Now, I didn't change it very much. Lathe moves. Law uh, is you can't make the inside bigger than the outside. And to avoid to avoid that, you have to uh, measure stuff. Okay, we got a long ways to go. As I make this cut, what I'm doing bouncing up and down, and what it does is it gives space for the tool, lets you uh, bore a hole. Normally, uh, people use uh, spindle gouges to do that. Say it. That's not a skew. Half inch round, no scraper. Uh, I've always been a box maker. I make a lot of things, but boxes are probably the most common. This is a box, right? Isn't it? Gonna cut a chamber, screw a lid on it. I'm just doing this to uh, get an idea of how much. Uh, it won't bother anybody if I. Otherwise, they go into my skivvies. The shavings do. I'm uh, right now just looking to see how much room I've got. Uh, 
Uh, for me, pipes are uh, a little bit of a sculpture. I mean, something you work at as you're going. Uh, I want this uh, end here to be have enough space to be broad enough to put that little uh, cap in. So I'm going to take a little bit more off. I haven't started hollowing the inside. Let's see. Okay, we'll do it. Oh. If I uh, start moving the rest around without turning things off, you won't get real mad at me, will you? That's why we have the shield. Okay. Everybody knows the definition of a happy motorcycle rider, don't you? Smiles, you can see the bugs in his teeth. Well, what do you think a happy wood turner is? You can see the shavings in his teeth. Okay, getting close. I'm going to start working on the inside. These are, uh, can you put that one on? Okay, there we are. These are, uh, Three tools I made for uh, hollowing the inside. Um, this is actually made out of a burnishing rod. I got it for 14 bucks or something, so it's pretty hard steel. I heated it up and bent it and ground it. Uh, this is Chinese tool steel, and uh, I'll, I'll pro I don't know if I'll actually need it, but if I do, if nothing else, I'll show you once how it works. You know, there's no handle on it there. And this is also a uh, Chinese tool that I bent and repurposed. So I'm going to open up the space a little. Funny. I think I'm actually drilling with this. I didn't know I could do that. <sighs> yeah, how about that? Okay, <laughs> we got a lot of room left. Um, this is what I do most of the work with. Not yet though, huh? I like to keep this uh, opening as small as I can. Um, mostly just because I think it's cool. Forms are all about feel.
One of the things that's interesting about this wood is you can, uh, you know, like a normal piece of wood with grain and everything, you can only cut it, uh, you can only cut downhill, right? But with a burl, you don't have that problem. Now these calipers, uh, they're made a little bit different from regular calipers. You know, most calipers, uh, the spring tries to open it and uh, this screw prevents it from opening. And the consequence is uh, you can never get past a big thickness to find a small thickness. These are made the opposite. The spring tries to shut it and the uh, screw holds it open. So you can get in past a thick place and find out how thick something actually is. And it's, for anybody doing any kind of hollow form, this is the best set of calipers I know of. You can get a smaller set. Ooh, mine does that too. depth of my chamber here has uh, a far end to it. You can't go uh, into, you don't want to get too close to the tobacco chamber. The tobacco chamber is too thin. If the walls are too thin, uh, it'll burn through or it'll smoke hot. And so I try normally I try to be pretty conservative. We're going to go for it. What do you think? Okay, so here's the depth. Got another uh, five eighths, three quarters of an inch. Sorry about that. I won't do that again. see what we got. One of the things about a lathe is it never complains when you turn it on and off. Never heard one complain. And so if you're doing things that really require close tolerances, it behooves you to check frequently. I don't know what that is. Oh, oh, a burnishing tool. Um, you know what a scraper is? You know, a woodworking scraper? Um, that edge is turned with a burnishing tool. You know, right, that's right. And I figured it was a nice, cheap, already handled, you know. See what we got. Ought to be close. That's that's the hole I drill. One more, one more cut. Oh, you guys do know. You know, the second law is uh, you can take it off, you can't put it back on. Third law is you can't make the inside bigger than the outside. Well, there's a disease, and it's called one more cut. I got a, a buddy who calls it uh, uh, better is the enemy of good enough. It's a little bit risky, 
you know, I haven't taken any of the shavings out. I'm just kind of making do. And so it's a little stiffer inside. There's a little bit less, uh, I don't know what to call it. Shavings can catch your tool. Let's see what we got. Uh, no, it's uh, no sudden motions. Most hollowing tools have, well, here, this shows it better, have a fairly narrow point where it's touching, right? And so they will dig into the wood very easily. And so what I'm doing is putting it on the wood and stroking. I'm, I don't try to dig in one place. And that's really what makes it work for me. No, that makes it inefficient. Yeah, the more you point it down, the less efficient. Uh oh. Uh, the less efficient the cut is. Yeah. And so I'm getting ready to do my final cuts. And so I'm getting all that stuff out of there. I like to have the inside of my uh, chambers fairly smooth. Wow. I knew I didn't like that. The way you make the inside of a hollow form smooth is you move slow. Spin fast, move slow. You know, long time ago in Europe, there was this uh, Chinese religious sect that went over there and at the time they were very, uh, they proselytized a lot and they traveled. I mean, they came all the way from China, right? So they're traveling all over Europe proselytizing. And they made a uh, kind of a home base in just one city. Uh, the city still has, you know, the name that, you know, they, they start calling it, you know, euphemistically uh, a specific nickname. And uh, the, the city eventually got renamed. You all know what it is, don't you? Budapest. Oh. Oh. I'm not going to tell you my other one. <laughs> On the, the box, uh, that's Carnuba. Yeah. OK, I think we're good. Um, we're going to prepare to chase a thread. Do the inside thread first. I don't always. In fact, I don't usually. Most of these boxes I chase the uh, male thread first. But because this is the, the hole that I have least control over, this is the one I chase first. I'm going to use 16 threads of the inch. What I'm doing now is uh, cutting a little rounded, it's not really a chamfer, but it's just a rounded edge. Lets me get the uh, chaser in without too much uh, uh, bump. You know, if you're trying to push a serrated tool, there we are, oh, good. If you're trying to push a serrated tool, uh, into an opening and you have a, a ledge, a bump, it will uh, slow the speed. A spiral or a, uh, a thread is a spiral. It's actually a straight line. It has no deviation. If you start introducing deviation, that's called a drunken thread. That's where it'll go around and then jump forward and go around and jump forward. And so that's a, a mark of a, a tyro. Isn't that cool? 
thread nature? As in the profile of the thread or a pipe thread? Pipe thread. No. Uh, the problem with a pipe thread is there's only one place that will lock, only one place that will tighten. That's okay, isn't it? Your lathe is real. Oh, it's the wheel. Okay. Uh, I'm going to uh, chase it somewhere as close to 400 RPM. 426, that'll work. Uh, this is uh, the thread chaser for the, the female thread, the inside thread. Um, I'm going to use the uh, arm brace. You don't have to. In fact, I originally learned to chase threads uh, just across the rest, but I prefer this now. Um, chasing threads is primarily practice, I mean literally. It's just for the first year, I, any day, for the first year, any day I did not chase a thread, I could tell. So, I'm sorry? Uh, I altered it. I didn't make it. It's a Sorby. Uh, my favorite thread chasing tool is Robert Sorby. They have a, uh, a sharp profile on the threads. Most of the other thread chasers are rounded. I don't like them as much. A real coarse thread. Uh, I sometimes uh, prefer the rounded thread. I think the coarsest thread I ever chased was, uh, oh, that's electricity conducting through the lathe that does that. We may just have to get by with it. Yeah, let's see what I can do. about rhythm. It's this muscle memory. Different pitches require, how about that? Different pitches require different uh, speeds, both lathe and uh, people. And so what you have to do is uh, recreate the uh, travel of the thread. The coarsest thread I've ever chased ooh, was a, uh, a five. Finest, I think, is a, uh, a 40. That's pretty close. What can you see? Nothing. Let's see if I get any tighter here. Other way. Yeah, well, I, oh, oh. How's that? Good? Okay. Here we go. Now it's fairly, you know, we were talking about pipe threads before. It's fairly important that the surface in here is parallel to the bed here, the ways. If it tilts this way, uh, you'll only catch on the first thread. If it tilts this way, you end up with a pipe thread. And it's, uh, it's really easy to cross thread at the start, and it uh, will only lock at one place. And that place it locks may not be airtight. You really need, uh, uh, something to touch here on this flat surface to be airtight. What am I going to do now? This is vulcanite. It's a uh, hard rubber. We're really lucky because I didn't bring any bigger stuff. <laughs> I have a little handsaw that I normally use to cut this off. Um, the difference in quality of uh, one kind of vulcanite over another is the quantity of sulfur in it. Uh, the low quality has a lot of sulfur in it and uh, the, the material oxidizes. It turns a green or a brown. You can taste it. And so this is called ebonite, which is 
one of the higher qualities, and it theoretically doesn't do that. Uh, I'm not going to make a stem today, but when I make them, I almost, almost always make them out of acrylic. Let's see, how long are we going to make it? We can always cut some off. If you cut it too short, you get embarrassed. I use a handsaw to do this. I am uh, a real stingy guy. I don't like to waste stuff. Uh, I have bowl gouges that are 20 years old. I go through spindle gouges pretty fast though. Now, we talked about uh, the second law, right? Take it off, can't put it back on. So, I'm only doing this to a small length of the material, and so if I mess up, I can throw it away. I can cut off that portion and not waste a whole piece. It's kind of a standard compensation or something. I don't know what you call that. I actually have a little more trouble cutting this thread than the inside one. Okay. Um, I'm going to round the front. Again, so it doesn't have any hitch in the giddy up. I have to cut a relief in the back. I didn't have to cut one before when I did the inside thread because there's a chamber behind it, which is just a big relief as far as thread chasing is concerned. This is not a good tool to do this with. I have never found a tool that makes me happy. This is what the mail chaser looks like. Uh, I sharpened this one on a grinder. I sharpen it by just laying it down on the wheel. The female chaser, I sharpen on a, a stone. Wet the stone and push it like that. Uh, I tried, you know, I really prefer if I could do it with this other one as well, the male chaser, but it just doesn't work. Uh, I'm not certain why. It doesn't. So I end up going through, and so the grinder's a lot faster than a stone, right? You end up grinding away. So I go grow through about three of these before I go through one of the others. Slow the lathe down. Normally I like to get a little closer. it up. Say it again? Uh, yeah, um, we, they call it thread chasing and the reason they do that is because the, uh, the tool tends to want to follow the trace of the thread and so it chases the thread. I think it's going to be too small. I think I'm going to have to start over. Let's give it, never say die on it. Let's give it another shot. It's, oh see what happens. I went to uh, turn in northern Arkansas and uh, Did they have electric? <laughs> and they uh, they told me they had this machine and you know a machine I, not the one I'm using here and so I planned my demonstration for it and then when I got there it turned out that the lathe was quite different. The slowest it would go, ah, the slowest it would go was 700. So that made for a very exciting experience. <laughs> what? 
Still. Yeah. Okay, we're good. It's going to work. Normally, I would uh, so like this distance here, what it's probably a full inch. I probably would be uh, half an inch or three eighths. So going across this gap here is a little bit trying. Okay. It works, wow. doesn't it? Yeah. Very cool. Uh, when I first started cutting the tenon, uh, I brought this other piece up to it and said the other piece has a, uh, a very slight chamfer on it. And so when the tenon starts to fit inside the chamfer, that's where you go. Okay. What he's talking about is I get the grain to line up uh, on my boxes. And remember I said I cut the male thread first. So if you cut this thread, you take it off the lathe, and you put this one on the lathe, and you cut this thread so that it screws in, the box fits. And in order to get the uh, grain to match up, what you do is you start taking material off of this surface. And that permits it to screw in a little further. <laughs> if, you do it, if you do it the other way, uh, you end up with a bigger gap between this shoulder and the thread. And I don't like that, so I always do it this way. Uh, one thing you've got to watch for, though, is uh, you can cut this so it fits perfectly today, and next week it won't anymore. And so what I typically do is leave it a sixteenth or a thirty-second of a turn short, and then later on you can take a little material off to, you know, after it's equalized. The other thing is, uh, give me a minute. What do you think? One more. <laughs> Okay, we'll, we'll pretend. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, when you turn, like let's pretend, I have a big lathe, right? My lathe will turn 10 feet by 30 inches. And uh, you turn a big hollow for him that's 24 inches across and a foot and a half deep. You get your bowl gouge. I have a four foot steel uh, pipe. It's 20, 20, what do they call it? Schedule 20 pipe. So it's a quarter inch wall. And so you're, you're, you can be back quite a ways and really working away on it. Um, and it's muscular. Thread chasing is the exact opposite. You have to surrender to what's <coughs> happening. The, particularly in the beginning, right? I mean, the, the, the trace of the thread is, I don't know, 256, 512th of an inch deep. But you've got to get back in it. It does you no good to get next to it. It has to get back in and it has to follow it. So you have to let it go. Okay, now, you guys may not know it, but I know it. I touched this shoulder with my tool when I was coming out. I really like to have not much of a gap between my thread and the shoulder. I think it's cool, okay? So I sometimes touch this shoulder. I have to retouch it, I have to re-square it. Otherwise it won't, uh, sit against this surface. Have to make sure it's flat. Okay, we're gonna pretend it's good. I'm going to uh, Sorry, is that a good shot or what? I'm proud of that one, Anthony. Okay. There you go. Okay, I still got a little bit of the oxidized material on the outside. 
Remember, you can always take more off later. One more? One more? Okay. Look at that. Just just peeking out right there. This is the cap that goes here. I'll drill a hole in it and the stem goes into it. It's an adapter. Ebonite, yes, it's a kind of hard rubber, vulcanite. Okay, I think that's good. Of course, I'm going to touch it again. To see. Uh, could be, yeah. You know, they used to make uh, bowling balls out of lignum. Yeah, lignum vitae. Only two holes. I saw some on eBay once, and I wanted them so bad. They sold real expensive, though. Okay, so what I'm going to do here, it's just too far. I don't know what that is. Uh, I'm going to indent this a little you don't have to it's just ego and that really is what it's about it's about the little bitty thing chamfer the front it's good it's the only thing, well, there's two things I'm going to sand, but sand it because I, I can't get back to it. This is 220. Oh, yeah, I have to touch this again. What time is it? How much I got? You're fine. What does that mean? It means, it means you look good. I look good. <laughs> Y'all are enjoying this demo, right? Yeah. All right. Okay. I'm going to sand this sh shoulder here. Do it again. Do it again. Let's do it again. There we go. Touch the uh, chamfer just briefly. This surface. Okay. Now we'll try some 400. You can always do this again later, you know, by hand. I hate sanding, though. So, anytime I can avoid it, I do. Okay, now I'm going to slow this all the way down. And I'm going to sand the thread. Doesn't take much. Go the other way. Okay, try some 600.
the, uh, this material doesn't really come up shiny wise until you uh, buff it. Don't forget to tip your waitresses. <laughs> I made that up. Do you know that? Okay. Uh, it's not quite right. It's a hair tight, which is the way I like it. That permits me to monkey with it at this end. Remember, uh, you can uh, take it off, but you can't put it back on. So here's how I actually learned to chase threads across the bar here. And the reason I'm doing it now is it allows me to be a little uh, tougher. And uh, the material, when I chased it the first time, I don't know if you can hear it, it felt very rough, like it was chipping. So I am uh, using an alternative method here to make it smoother. Oh, okay. Okay, I like that. Um, now, the next operation, is remember I left a little shoulder here, right? Uh, the thing I forgot was a little square end cutter. And we'll... Uh, use our borrowed cutoff tool. Now, uh, doing what I just did created a, uh, it disrupted the front of that thread and so I have to cut my chamfer now Otherwise, that will never get a true fit. Oh, that's why I had it. Okay. Put the chamfer back in. Think. Oh. Go to it. What? Now we got it. Okay. And so what I did was just made it so that it goes inside. Uh oh. There we go. Now, it's too much. Got way too much there. You know what's really bad about some wood shops? Concrete floors. Yeah, that's right. Who cleans up their shop every time? I use a snow shovel. I mean, literally. Of course, I can use that in my living room, too, so it didn't matter. <laughs> You know what's funny is the cats go out, I got two cats, and they go out and catch ground squirrels or chipmunks, and invariably they let them go. It takes them days to catch them. <laughs> There's stuff everywhere. A lot of places to hide. You guys got flying squirrels down here? I had a cat bring one in once. That is, I've never seen an animal like that. I've well, I've seen pictures of them, but I've never seen one. I really like them gray, mousy, a little bigger than a ground squirrel. Big eyes. Um, this is still too big, really. But it's, I, uh, I'm going to leave it because I've never done it this way. And so, so 
fourth law, we haven't talked about the fourth law yet, have we? The fourth law is the bevel never cuts. You know, this flat part. No matter how hard you press that, it will not cut. And so, what you do, you see, ah, you've got to show me the top one. There we go. You touch the wood in such a way that it can't cut, and the bevel is rubbing, but it's just real light. And then slowly rotate it down, and you can use any portion of the bevel to do your work. You know, they sometimes call this uh, a scrape, but it's not, as long as you're using your bevel. Okay. Um, what do you think? I'm going to do it again. There we go. Okay. Now I have to, I'm going to drill this for the stem. And so just like I did the last time, I'm going to uh, cut a little place the drill bit to start. Now there's a there's a distinct problem uh, f f that you encounter when you chase threads. Uh, it's very easy to get it threaded too tightly so you can't pull it out, take it out with your fingers. And part of the problem is the two thread surfaces have not been uh, buffed. And so they have rough places and those rough places match, not match, but they engage and uh, uh, you won't be able to unscrew them. It's very embarrassing to do in demos. And so, I, I, I don't know that we're going to have problems, but this is another tool, and this is just a rubber glove. You never stick your hand in it, but it gives you something to grip with, and that can make all the difference. Um, I don't, you know, I don't use any certain size of uh, drill bit. I bury them around. My stains are the same, you know. I go to these... Uh, pipe conventions, pipe shows, and, and sell things, and there are trade secrets, you know, colors of stains and things. I never make the same one twice. Okay, got to slow it down. Now, remember before, uh, I started doing it by hand because things don't run true. Well, uh, the diameter of the hole you're making, there's going to be a ratio to its length before you can start doing it by hand, otherwise you can end up cattywampus. And this never approaches it. It's too wide, and so you'd have to go in three quarters of an inch before you could start doing it by hand. And so you just have to make do with what you get. There we are. Doesn't have to be too deep. Definitely doesn't have to be very wide. Can't see much, can you? No. Okay. Uh, and so now I'm going to sand it. Uh, have we talked about gugas? You might know what a guga is. A guga is anything that's decorative, which but which serves no function. If I weren't lazy, I would put shorter screws in this. You know the chuck. Did you see the chuck? But I just, you know how come the Arkansas guy never uh, fixes the roof? Why does the Arkansas guy never fix the roof? 
because if it's raining, you can't go out, and if it's not raining, you don't need to. And so it's the same with my chuck here. It only hurts when I turn, and you can't stop then, so. Can't get people too going here. Okay, so I'm gonna put a couple of goo gaws in here. There you go. Now, theoretically, it's all done inside. I'm gonna touch it on the outside though. Now, I dished this, the end of it. You can see that it's inset. So to match it, I'm gonna dish this a little bit. And this is a true scrape. Okay. Now, this is the next to the last sanding I'm going to do. I only sand parts that uh, I can't get at later. I usually sand uh, wood. Uh, hardwoods, exotics, uh, to uh, 400, and uh, natives like cherry, walnut, oak to 220. Never, rarely, rarely sand more than that. Did I say I don't like sanding? Now, we're going to start cutting on the outside. We have this chamber on the inside. It is against the rules to go through. Uh, we did talk about you can't make the inside bigger than the outside. Well, there's a corollary. You can't make the outside smaller than the inside. And so I'm going to cut. I want to do as much work on the lathe as I can. And so what I did was I just looked at, uh, well, you know, how big is my bowl here? Uh, this is the center of the bowl. This, I don't know if you can see it. There's a pencil. Oh, yeah, good. It's a pencil line. And so I can cut that far before I start infringing on the bowl. never complains. Okay, right about there is where it starts getting a little thick. I don't know what I've got this set at. More than an eighth, I think. However, you see this flat spot? That has to come out. And so even if you, the piece of wood dies, that's got to come out. Ooh, that's backwards. Okay, here we go. That sound at the end, uh, that is a harmonic vibration starting. Got a little bit of flat left. Uh, harmonic vibrations uh, are generally 
a result of uh, the bevel pressing more than the cutting edge. You end up with a teeny, teeny, tiny bump. And then as the tool moves, moves forward, the bump goes under the bevel, which adds a little bit to the bump. And then the next time it goes over that added bump, it adds another little bump. And so you end up with this progressive bump, is, bump creation. Uh-oh. Oh. You know, in the wood turning world, worms dig things. I mean, that's good, right? Not in the pipe world. They think that's almost a sin. This is a bark inclusion. Why? No, sorry, never mind. <coughs> You know, oh, I already said that, didn't I? <laughs> you can't make the outside bigger than the inside, or smaller than the inside. So, oh, we got all the room in the world. Think we should go back on the inside? No, he says, we're done with this. Let's move on. We need closure. Okay, now, uh, I'm going to undercut this a little, and I'm going to undercut it just because, I don't know, it's what I do. We haven't talked about the first law yet, have we? The first law is, it ain't the tool. See that harmonic vibration? That sound? That's what causes that spiral effect. Or, it's accompanying the spiral effect. Okay, so, uh, I already sanded this. One of the last things that's important here is we have created a plane with this two-jawed chuck. The screws are there for a purpose. What they do is they provide pivot points, and so I can move this, pivot it, and keep it in the same plane. And it's very important. Can you stand those vibration rods out? Yeah. Um, when I get ready to uh, uh, do the handwork, that'll come right out. Okay. Somebody made a mess. Do you have a, a writing implement? <laughs> Analog? Never mind. Oh yeah, there we are. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to risk your. It sometimes it uh, oh. sometimes it overheats the little ball. Now, can you imagine what this would be like if that weren't hollow? It would be wildly uh, 
uh, off or what do you call it? Too heavy on one side. Yeah, but since it's hollow, it's not too bad. Remember that bouncing step? There it is again. Now this is another place where the pipe smoker guys are really particular. The uh, the draft hole has to, has to be in the very bottom of the chamber. They will say bad things about you and your mother. She's not even there. Um, I said it's not vital how big that is. I typically go about 964 in diameter for it. Um, the, the real current fashion is four millimeters, whatever that is. Tobacco chambers currently are generally between three quarters and seven eighths of an inch in diameter probably never less than one and a quarter inches deep and uh, rarely more than two inches, I don't know, what did I, oh yeah, never less than one, about an inch and a quarter and usually never more than two. And having said that, there's all kind of variety out there. In the olden days, they used to make, uh, you know, a lot of freeform pipes. And they had uh, much larger bowls. It tended to be tapered. My uh, size gauge is this finger. Let's see. Okay. We got room. Now, we got a problem. Remember I said it's really important that you get this right. Oh, there we go. See, that's what I wanted. I think I've got it plugged up with shavings. What I'm doing is uh, making it a little deeper. Part of why it's important to get that out there now is because when I, I'm cutting this draft or the tobacco chamber to meet that, and if it's not far enough out, I won't see it. Who knows what the nib is? That little point in the bottom of a The nib requires direct touch. If you touch the very, very top edge of the middle of the scraper on the nib, it cuts. It likes to cut. If you get anywhere near it, it will shy. Right? Up, down. And so what you do, you just barely touch it. Let your tool move around until you find the nib. It sticks out, you feel it. And once you hit it, you drill a hole and you cut side grain by moving the tool sideways. 
makes everything easy. It's difficult to go directly into end grain, but the center, if you touch it exactly right, cuts very nicely. Okay, here we go. Okay, so what? I'm within three sixteenths. That means we should start seeing things. I don't see anything. Find the nib. Cuts real nice straight in. We don't even need to. Oh. There you go. Okay. Let's see. Make sure it's deep enough. Show me again. Show me the top. Over here. Yeah. Okay, here we go. This way. And it's just coming in from the side. It looks like I went, no, it looks like I did okay. It's just barely peeking in. And what that means is I don't have to make a big, big broad opening in the bottom. I can keep it kind of narrow. I can make the bowl uh, curve in a little bit, conical. If you uh, drill the draft hole too far, you end up having to make the bowl deeper, and it makes the uh, makes the draft hole look like it comes in too high. Okay, let's see what that does. I hate doing it. One more. Oh, you know how to make an inexpensive monster? You take old French money and you put it in a German beer glass. Oh! Okay, that's good. Uh, one more cut to make it smooth. Just to make it smooth. Just because we can. Okay. How deep are we? Remember, uh, between one and a quarter, and two inches is a bowl, and it's 1.8. And so I generally, that's like uh, a tenth of an inch deeper than I generally like to make. We're going to use gouges. Okay. It's good. Make a little chamfer because pipe smokers like them. See what we did?
Now, you have to really concern yourself with the weight of the pipe. And with these pipes, since the end near the stem is hollow, all the weight is out here in the, the bowl. And it's nice to have a, a thick, round, pretty bowl. But it can be expensive in weight. That's good, isn't it? Okay. That's, I mean, that's it. That's how far you turn when you make uh, um, pipes. You can also, and, and you're going to turn a stem. Start out with a, a disc. I made a disc for my uh, lathe, and I usually put 60 or 80 grit sandpaper on it and uh, do as much of this work as I can. And then uh, uh, I go to a, uh, a small disc that I made out of a scuba diving sweatsuit. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then you start with files and sandpaper.